Hey, good afternoon, everybody. How are you? Yeah, okay, the first one is always a little, you know, light. The next one, you guys are all ready? Okay, so, how you doing? Yeah, if I kept going, like, eventually we get, uh, would we get amazingly loud? I don't know. Yeah, okay. We'll try it at the end if there's time, okay? So you have something to look forward to. All right, so this is Powering a Lean Startup with Drupal. That's the name of this talk, and my name is Chris Shattuck, and I'm a horrible parent. I just wanted to let you guys know. I practice my talk. Uh, I practice my talks on my four-year-old son, um, which is it's kind of brutal, right? But it's really interesting as well because we end up having this conversation. It's just a bunch of non sequiturs, and I get a sense of uh, I get a sense of how us as adults might react to certain, you know, aspects of a presentation, right? And part of us is still four years old, so even though we don't, we're not going to, like, start talking about Mario Brothers midway through a talk, we might feel like we want to. And so, and I think it's good practice. So I threw in some spaceships and some kittens into this talk, hopefully, you know, to, to, to entice him, but also, you know, maybe you guys will get some benefit from it, too. Yeah? All right. Okay, so this is the URL up there if you want to listen. I recorded it. That's even worse, right? I recorded the, the talk with my kid, and so you can hear the, the crazy things that a four-year-old says. All right, so the reason I'm giving this talk is because I run a startup called Build a Module. I create video tutorials to help people learn Drupal. And uh, I've been working on it full-time for a couple of years now. And when I come to Drupal events like this one or Drupal camps, I end up talking with people quite a bit about the business side of this because most of us are entrepreneurs on some level or trying to figure out what to do next. And so, uh, you know, we draw from each other in terms of how to deal with the logistics around that or how to, you know, what are the tips and tricks on, on making the steps up to running a successful startup. So um, this talk is really a response to that. It's some of the best advice or tips I can give as you work your way towards a startup yourself. How many of you guys are interested in running a startup yourself? Awesome. And how many of you are right now? You're doing it. Living the dream. Okay. <laughs> okay, doing it. It's two different things, right? Okay. So uh, that's really great. That's really great to hear. I hope there's something of value to you here, or maybe you'll recognize some of this uh, in yourself. Part of this has to do with lean, so the lean startup ethos and the model. A part of it has to do with Drupal, ways that Drupal can help with the process. But then there's other things, too, that have to do with, uh, with, with maybe the softer side uh, of, our, of ourselves. I, that sounds weird. But, you know, we'll, we'll get to some good stuff, hopefully. I, I'd like to begin by saying thank you. So uh, anybody out there a member of Build a Module or has been a member at some point? Okay. Thank you so much. Um, it, it, Build a Module has become sustainable in such a way that I'm able to create a pretty uh, flexible workflow. And a couple months ago, my dad got pretty sick. This is a little personal, right? But my dad got, got sick. But I was able to basically drop everything I was doing and, and help him get back on his feet. And uh, that was a really valuable experience for me and probably the best payoff that running a startup has had for me so far. Really, like, is there any better payoff than being able to help the people around us when they need it, right? So, so this is part of uh, looking for, looking ahead and seeing why we want to start up. This might be one thing. But for me personally, I just need to say thank you to everybody who had a part in that, uh, which you did by just supporting me. So thanks. Okay, so I'd like to give you just a couple minute background on how I got to this point. Uh, hopefully it provides some relevance. It will at least be one story of how an individual, you know, makes a career moves and blunders or whatever, um, but I'll try to keep it brief. So I graduated from college with a degree in sociology, which basically means nothing, <laughs> right? Any sociologists in the room? Yeah, yeah, right. We find other things to do to actually make money. So I worked at a campground. Yeah, right? It's, it's natural, natural transition. So I started working at a campground and interviewing people as they came in to stay at a campsite to, to ask them what they did for a living, uh, to get a sense of maybe what I might actually really want to do with my life. And web development sounded pretty cool. Uh, I had a computer, which was all you need in order to, to do it, basically. 
basically. And, uh, and I always wanted to geek out a bit. So I, th I thought I'd go this route. So I spent a couple of slow winters working on, uh, working on learning coding, learning design, and how to maybe market, how to deal with clients. And started asking around, seeing if anybody needed a site. This one gallery said they did. I, I uh, bid for the job. I got it. Did the work. They were happy with it, even though I was totally noob on it. And when I tallied up the numbers, I was making four times more per hour than I was at the campground, so I quit. It makes sense, right? Uh, and I'd like to say I went into freelancing full-time, but what I actually did was I went into trying to network full-time, which is a lot more miserable. So, you know, I, I went to networking meetings. I went to... I, I signed up for Toastmasters and got up at 5.30 in the morning to, like, try to talk with people. You know, kind of crappy things like that. Um, after six months, though, I had enough business that, it, that I was able to pay the bills. And so my wife and I were able to buy a little home and uh, pay the rent and stuff like that. During this time, I lived with my in-laws to kind of cut down on expenses, which was helpful. Uh, but it was nice to move out, too. Um, so I freelanced for quite a while before I started building a content management system to make it easier to uh, create these websites over and over again for different clients, which is a very common progression. And then at some point, I wanted help with it. And after finally going on Google <laughs> and looking like, oh, yeah, I discovered Google about this time, too, uh, <laughs> found out that a lot of people had done this already, including this one project, Drupal. And after looking at their architecture and talking with some people, I decided to go to Drupal uh, completely. So I read Pro Drupal Development, which was a really valuable book at the time. It was uh, you know, Drupal 5. And I just started doing all my projects in Drupal, which was uh, kind of just went in cold turkey, which was probably the best way to learn. So about six months into working with Drupal, I got offered a job to work on a large-scale Drupal project. It had a budget of over a million dollars, which to me was a pretty big deal at the time. And uh, it would still be a big deal for me now. But, uh, but I, I get to work with a team of Drupal people, which is kind of a, a really exciting thing if you've been freelancing for a while. So I decided to do it. So I worked on this job uh, for about a year. I learned a lot of really important stuff. But it kind of reached a cap of both the challenges and the income level I could reach as a Drupal developer, which is substantial, right? If you're a Drupal developer, you, there's good news for you. But there's still a cap on what you can make. And so I wanted to figure out what was next. I kind of wanted some new challenges. And I had read this book called The 4-Hour Workweek at this time. How many of you have read that book? Yeah? Okay. Quite a few of you. If you haven't, pick it up. There's something in it for you that's kind of fun. But one of the big takeaways for me was this idea that in order to break through the cap of what you can make if you're selling your time, you have to have a product. You have to have something that you make once and then can sell many, many times over. And that's the only way. That's the only way you're going to do it. So coming out of this job, I split my time between two things. I started subcontracting for freelance shops so that basically I didn't have as much to think about and I could rely on the number of hours that I'd be working. And then the rest of the time, I started prototype, uh, prototyping the first Build-A-Module site. And I recorded 30 video tutorials on Drupal development, how to program, and put it out there with a shopping cart and let a few people in the Drupal community know that it existed. And I, I, I really didn't, ex I didn't, I didn't know what to expect, right? But I got some orders that came through the site. And I was excited and just kind of waiting for their email back, asking for their money. <laughs> because, like, yeah, you know, it wasn't perfect. But nobody asked for their money back, which was a great illustration to me of one of the lean startup principles, which is that you put something out there before it's perfect. Because the market will tell you what it wants uh, to make it better. So, so I just kind of got to use that. I didn't purposely do it. It was just a time thing. But, but it, it worked. So after looking at the numbers, I wasn't making a ton of money that way. But I thought that maybe if I could make enough content for enough subsections of the Drupal community and work on some of the problems that uh, we face with video learning, like it's kind of hard on some levels, then maybe, maybe I could uh, make a living doing this. So I stopped working altogether. And I spent three months building the, another version of the Build-A-Module site. I recorded a couple hundred video tutorials, tackling some other subjects, and I put it out there. And I gave myself six months. I said, if in six months I'm able to pay the bills, I'll keep going. I'll keep working on it. Otherwise, I'll go back to the drawing board and figure out what went wrong, try something else. 
after three months, I hit that point. I, like, I didn't have very high expenses, which helped, uh, but, uh, but I hit that point, and I've been working on it ever since. Okay, so this, uh, uh, hopefully that wasn't too long. But this, this uh, w for one, this shape might look familiar, and I just wanted to sort of <laughs> explain why, and also throw in a spaceship, because, you know, the four-year-olds in us need spaceships sometimes. Um, but this, this sort of shape is all about states of being, like careers, uh, what you're doing as a, what I'm doing as a job, but then the transitions. And the transitions is pretty much what I want to talk about for the rest of this time, because those are the, those are the hard parts, um, making, making those moves between things. So, so there's a lot about my story that's idiosyncratic, right? It's just me. It's just, you know, everybody's story is going to be different, so, you know, we'll all tell it differently. But one thing that's the same are these transitions. We have to make transitions from one step to another step in order to continue improving our lot, you know, in seeking whatever it is that we're seeking. So there's three things that I think go into making a transition actually work. And they're the same for all of us, regardless of how old you are, regardless of if you have families, regardless of if you're just out of college or just hitting retirement. It's the same for all of us. And the first is that we have to see the next step, the next thing that we're going to do, as less risky than the one than, than where we're currently at. Otherwise, we're not going to we're not going to make a move, right? If you see freelancing as less risky and you're an employee, then you're not going to make that move because there's nothing in you that's going to support that. So you have to kind of figure out how you can see that next transition. If you need if you know you need to make it, you have to figure out how to see it as less risky than the thing that you're currently doing. So that's step, that's the first part. The second part is that you need money. Because transitions take time. During a transition, you have to learn some stuff. You have to build some social networks. There might be a variety of things you have to do, and that takes time. You're going to burn through expenses during that process. But really, it's just time. You're just buying time. So saving up some money for those transitions is also a necessity. Of course, you can't save uh, a ton. Most of us can't save a ton for each transition. So we also have to set kind of a time limit and say, Okay, within this time period, we'll give it this. We'll give it a shot, and then then we just have to save up some more and try again if it doesn't work. And the final thing that we need is a little bit uh, maybe harder to put your finger on, but uh, what stops most of us from successfully making a transition is that we back out before we complete it. We get scared because as you sort of make a leap from one thing to another, from one job to another, you're you're in the air. There's no solid footing. And so during that time, it's really easy to just say, okay, I want to go back to something I know that's comfortable. So we have to do what we can to increase our stamina for uncertainty. We have to be okay with that process uh, of not really knowing what's going to happen next because that's the only way that we'll be able to make those transitions. And so I want to talk about, you know, some strategies for building that. If you isolate the, that uh, colony ship of my life into sort of the important phases that I think are generally applicable to us all. It's, there's, there's two big transitions, I think, uh, that I suggest making. We can always go from employeeship to a startup. We can always make that jump. But I suggest freelancing in the middle for a variety of reasons, which I'll talk about. So these are the big transitions between employeeship and freelancing and between freelancing and a startup. But why are we, so why are we pointing to a startup, though, as the sort of end all? as the thing that we want to build up to, or that we're building. Many of you are in the process of building it now, which is super cool. So, so why? Well, if, if you break it down, there's probably a whole list of things that, that you think you're going to get from it, right? One is that you might make more money. Well, you're going, you're going at it to make more money, partially at least. But that only really satisfies us up to a certain point. After that point, it's the amount of impact that we have on the world. It's how we can change the lives of other people. It's the good we can do. Like that's a, a much stronger driver for us. Once we've reached a baseline of income, that's going to be much bigger. And finally, we kind of might run out of challenges as employees or as freelancers, and running a startup is going to give us more to work with. We'll try some new things. We'll have to solve some new problems. But I think all of these things lead up to one big goal, which is not unhappiness. So I did a Google search for happy, and I'm like, I gotta throw that up there, right? For you, those of you in the back, she looks super unhappy. I don't know what's going on there. But this cat looks much happier in contrast. 
yeah, I promised kittens, right? So, so even though we have these goals to change our circumstances in terms of money we make, in terms of the job we have, whatever, all of it arguably leads up to greater happiness. We want to be, to enjoy life, right? If we didn't have to do these things in order to enjoy our life more, we would skip it and go right to the part where we're enjoying life more. So in addition to happiness sort of being our goal, and, and I'm using happy loosely, right? Not all of us like that word because it's, it comes with baggage. But if you, you can think of it as well-being or enjoyment of life, whatever sort of works for you. Uh, in addition to it being the goal, it's also a currency. It's also fuel we use to make transitions that are challenging. Because if we can enjoy ourselves in the process of jumping from one point to another, we have a lot longer to make that transition before we exhaust ourselves, right? So, so um, fostering happiness, cultivating happiness in whatever way we can is a big deal for making sure that we don't bail too early before we actually make a transition. So on the one hand, this sounds like, you know, like a little foo-foo, right? Because like, yeah, of course, every, everything on TV tells us what, they, what we can do to be happier. You know, everything around us is telling us that we can be happier if we do X, right? So I think it's important to break down the pieces that we know about happiness because that helps us make choices about what can cultivate our happiness. And there are some things we know from uh, studies that have, said, that have been done. So one of them is really interesting, I think, which is that about 50% of our happiness level, this is based on a study that they did of identical and fraternal twins, about 50% of our happiness level is genetic. So that might be bad news for some of you. Uh, for those of you, I realize this, for those of you for whom it is bad news, you might not have a lot of happiness in this 50% genetic area. So I'm sorry. <laughs> That's kind of a feedback loop, right? But, but there's 50% left. So this is, a good, this is a good news. And of that 50 per, uh, of that 50%, 40% is intentional activity. It's stuff that we decide to do at any given time. So there's at least a handful out of, uh, of you out there right now who might be unhappy for any particular reason, right? I'm not talking about what you were hoping I'd talk about. Uh, maybe the guy next to you is snoring, you know, something like that. Well, uh, those things can be changed by simply uh, ex uh, executing your control over your environment. You can just, like, nudge the guy next to you. You can like, go do something else or pull out your computer, right? There's options for you almost at any time when there are conditions that are making you unhappy. There's something you can do to make it happier. So 40% of our, of our joy sort of comes from those intentional actions, which is amazing. That's a lot of choice that we have. So this, this little uh, orange slice, which you may or may not be able to read, is, is our circumstances. But only 10% of our happiness level comes from our uh, circumstances. So this is how attractive we are. This is how much money we have. This is where in the world we live. This is what job we have. All of these things add up to about 10%, which is really weird because I think most of us, when we think about or describe how we're trying to improve our lives, kind of point to something in this sort of, uh, on this list and say, yeah, that's what I'm going for, you know? But it's really not going to have that tremendous of an effect on us, which I think is amazing to know. And you may not believe it, but think about it for a little while. Maybe it'll sort of sink in. So another thing that makes us happy are puppies and babies, especially puppies pushing babies up. I'm just kidding. That does, that does make me happy, but this, uh, this picture illustrates a, a larger, a broader principle, which is that of the things that we can do intentionally to make us happier, one of the big things is helping other people. It actually releases the same chemicals in our body when we do something for somebody else as when we drink juice or do drugs. Like, this is those same positive chemicals are released. So why is it so much fun to help people? Well, it's because, like, it's actually doing something physiologically to us. So if we can integrate that with what we do in our work lives especially, then we, where, where sometimes we don't always have the opportunities to do those things, then we're going to get a lot more joy out of the process. So this comes into play when I start talking about Drupal in a bit. So money makes a difference in terms, uh, money makes a difference in our happiness level, but only to a certain point. At about $50,000, we reach the peak of how much money can affect our happiness. $50,000 a year uh, as, in, as income. At that point, we're meeting all of our big needs, right? We don't have to worry about the electricity being turned off, our kids are fed, you know, we're, we're golden. 
beyond that point, between 50000 and $5 million, the happiness level of people increases only a small amount. It is a, it is a bit of an amount. You know, it's a little bit. But it's not huge in, in any way. So I think that's important because if we're making moves in our careers in order to make more money, then, you know, chances are there's not going to be a big payoff there for us if that's our, our only reason or our primary reason for it. For a lot of us, we want to make more money so that we can save more money so that we increase our security level, so that we can get closer to retirement, so that we can do some big things in the future, right? Well, well, that's another story, right? So we, we're amazing. You are amazing. All of you guys are amazing. I could have told you that without these slides, but the slides help too. And one of the things that makes us amazing is that when big changes happen to us, we adjust to them really fast. It's called hedonic adaptation. And so this, this comes into play in a really positive way when bad things happen to us, like we get diagnosed with a chronic disease. Well, after, after being diagnosed with a chronic disease, within one or two months, many of us will uh, get right back to the same level, level of happiness we were before. It has no impact on our level of happiness. But if really big things happen, really big good things happen to us, like we win the lottery, which is arguably good, uh, for those of uh, for those people who do get positive feelings from that, uh, they go back to the same level of happiness a, about a year later. So, if you are saving up for money for retirement for big things down the road, then chances are you're going to get some payoff in terms of happiness, but it's not going to be long term. It's going to expire. You're going to adjust. So you may find that focusing on the the the, the sooner payoffs in happiness, your day to day stuff you're going to end up having a greater net level of happiness. And that's what you need. This is a currency, right? We're trying to get more happy so that we can do difficult things and make our way towards doing something where we make more money and have greater impact on the world. So, okay, so these are all interesting things. Anybody find these interesting? Yeah? All right. Anybody not find these interesting? <laughs> okay, sorry. That's a cruel question to ask. Okay, so these people are happy because they were asked to jump and smile. But they look happy for that reason. But some people are actually happy at their jobs, which uh, if, they're, if you're an employee, some people are happy doing that. And I'm completely jealous. I've never had a job where I was really satisfied as an employee. But if you have one of those, then your goal is achieved, right? And the whole idea of move, you know, making multiple transitions to get to the point where you're running a startup, maybe that's not very attractive because you're, you've got everything you need. But for most of us, uh, there's there's some something lacking with employeeship. So I wanted to stick freelancing and employeeship into a, a cage and kind of uh, have them fight in a sort of a bullet pointed way up here. So let's compare uh, being an employee to being a freelancer and kind of see what the you know benefits uh, benefits might be to freelancing and the problems with employeeship. So as a as an employee. Your time is dictated in a big way. So you have a certain number of hours you have to work. You have meetings you have to go to. But as a freelancer, you get to set your hours. For the most part, freelancers tend to work more, actually more net hours. But they get a lot more control of when those hours are. So you get to craft your life in such a way so that you can take advantage of things that you'll get joy out of. Like if it's a really nice day, you can just take a break and, and take advantage of that. Uh, you can take a month off to, to work on something. So, so we get that we get that advantage as, as freelancers, as an employee. And by the way, if there's any bosses out there, I don't mean to rag on on you guys at all. You're probably all awesome bosses, and you're an awesome boss. And uh, and your your employees are probably all really happy. But just in quite just in case there's other people here who aren't, this might be this might outline some of those things, right? Okay. Disclaimer. So, as an employee, the skills that you build are dictated by what's uh, needed in your job. Uh, and those skills may be very outdated. You may be working with old technology that's only good within the, within the company that you're working for. Whereas when you're a freelancer, you have to choose skills that are saleable, that are uh, needed in the marketplace. And you also get to choose the skills you want. So these are skills that may, you may use later. Uh, as sort of fuel for your startups or, you know, to build other things that you've always wanted to build. So you get to choose what skills to build, which is a big deal. As an employee, your job is making your bosses happy, really. Uh, 
they're, they're kind of the primary target. But as a freelancer, your job is to make the market happy because you're dealing with the people who are actually buying stuff. And so you get to know where the inefficiencies are in your work. So if you do a lot of stuff and the people who uh, you're freelancing for don't really find it valuable, well, you've just discovered a big way that you can save on time. And if you, you'll find little things that you can do to make your clients happy that don't take a lot of time, right? So those kinds of things, those type of insights that you develop while freelancing mean that those, those are things that you can take when you start to build a startup. There are ways that you can identify needs in the marketplace and how to sort of deal with the market. Okay, so finally, when you're an employee, your income is dictated not only by the market, but by politics within the company. Like you can only make a certain amount. You shouldn't make more than somebody who's been working longer than you, right? Those, those types of things. But as a freelancer, you're, what you charge is dictated by your own decision and also by what the market will pay. So you can work your way up to making the highest possible amount you can for the skills that you have in whatever industry you're in which is inevitably going to be more, sometimes significantly more, than you can make as an employee. So all that makes sense? Yeah. You guys you guys, good? It's late, isn't it? It's like 4.30. You guys are like, I'm ready for dinner. You know, my brain is full. Yeah. So, um, so feel free to just use my voice as sort of massage on your head. You don't even have to hear the words. So you like massage that information in, get it in order. I, I totally, that's totally fine, okay? What, what's that? Oh, the video will be online anyway. Why are you guys here? <laughs> so I tell every, yeah, that's so funny. I should have started this out. I tell everybody I meet, don't go to any sessions. Just talk to people out there. What, these will be recorded. So if y'all want to just bail now, it's totally fine. I'll finish this so you guys can listen to it later. It's totally fine. But just in case that you feel bad <laughs> about walking out now, let me continue talking about freelancing, because based on the previous slide, freelancing is awesome, right? But actually, freelancing is super tricky. How many people have here have dabbled in freelancing or do freelancing all the time? Oh, yeah. Uh, so you know what I mean. I should see a bunch of nods with this. So freelancing is really hard, and here's why. One is that if you imagine a teeter-totter, and there's holes in the teeter-totter, and there's spikes underneath each teeter-totter, and you're going down like this, and then you're like, well, maybe the other side is more comfortable, and you go over there, and you go down, and the spikes are just coming up through the teeter-totter. That's kind of like freelancing, right? Anybody? Okay, so the idea here is that we're either really busy or we're not busy enough, and both are, both are uncomfortable situations. We either have too much uh, being thrown at us, we have too many clients to deal with, or we don't have enough and we're panicking because, oh my gosh, I have to pay the bills, that type of thing. So kind of uncomfortable, it seems like we're never in the middle. And there's a lot more factors. We have uh, a lot more clients we have to deal with. We have uh, taxes. We have logistics, right? So a lot more usually than you have to deal with as an employee. And finally, one of the biggest things is that by definition, freelancing is something that we do by ourselves. And this means that, you know, we could be working. What ends up happening is you end up working really hard you know, all by yourself. And one day you look up and you're like, what? Where did everybody go? <laughs> And you realize you haven't seen, like, your friends in a month, and you just get disconnected. Whereas when you're an employee, a lot of times you're part of a community. You get to see people at lunch and blah, 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 right? Uh, and there's nothing more stressful to human beings than being separated from our communities. So all this adds up to a whole lot of stress, which makes freelancing not sustainable for most of us. So I have some tips, some ways to maybe sustain working through the process of, of freelancing, and one of which is a way to look at it. So I see freelancing as startup school. So, so this, this helps orient you in a couple of ways. One is that it's, it's time limited. We don't go to school. Most of us don't go to school forever, right? Unless we're really scared of the real world. Um, but, you know, like most of us, it's a temporary thing. But also our goal is to learn as much as possible through the process. It isn't to make it as easy as possible. We want to learn as much as we can so that we can use that information later to do something valuable. So we can learn all of the, most of the same things that we can freelancing uh, before we run a startup. So we can, we can learn all this stuff later when we're doing our startup. But the thing is that when you're freelancing, you get paid for it. 
Whereas when you're doing a startup and you're having to learn all this stuff, you don't get paid, so you have a, a much shorter time period to work with. Whereas freelancing, you can work and work until you're like, I know what I'm doing, I have ideas, I'm ready to go. Okay, so this is why I, this is the big reason I encourage why I encourage freelancing. I've been talking all day too, so I'm like, where does where to start? Okay, so uh, one one way that you can see freelancing as less risky than your current job is by getting some success in it, by getting a few jobs or maybe even one job. Like like I got one job and I was sold. Where you see that you can do it, where you can make people happy, you have the skills to do it. Um, so consider going part time with your work or just moonlighting for a while, which basically means don't do anything fun for a little bit <laughs> and just just work on something else and get get a couple of successes, and that might be enough to encourage you to make the leap. Um, I also encourage you not to work for for huge clients. Huge clients insulate you a lot from the market stuff. Uh, working with small clients gets you a lot closer to what's going on out there and also gives you these mirrors of insight into what you're going to look like in a little bit when you run your startup. So you work for small clients, you get to see them make mistake after mistake, you get to see them have really weird ideas, and some of those weird, weird ideas work and most of them don't. And you get to derive a lot from that experience that you don't have to do yourself, right? So these are, this is all stuff that you can pull into your uh, your toolbox when you get to the point where you're going to run your startup. So small clients small clients are really irritating, but but they teach you a lot. Okay, and some of them are really cool. So another thing that makes us amazing besides hedonic adaptation is that we rarely forget about stuff that's important to us. So. If you thought, okay, I have to, you know, I have to turn off the beans cooking on the oven in 20 minutes, like your brain will generally remind you of that. Maybe not 20 minutes from now, maybe like two hours from now, but it'll happen. Your brain will just like keep that and run it in this carousel. So as you've been sitting here, my guess is that most of you haven't been keeping count, but you've probably thought of several things that you have to do, either later, after you get done with this, when you get home from the camp or from the con, you know, something like that. But the deal is that if you can take all that part of your brain that's dealing with reminding you constantly about what you have to do, and you get rid of you, 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 you use some other tool to remember all that stuff, then it frees up your brain to focus on what you're doing right now, which is much more valuable. So this book, Getting Things Done, how many of you have read Getting Things Done? Okay. So many of you have read it. Those of you who haven't, this book outlines how to do that, how to create a system to free up your brain to focus. So for me, this was uh, an incredible thing to feel. And over time, entropy sets in, old habits come back, but I can always come back to this if I need, if I get overwhelmed and it really helps a lot. Uh, one of the best moves I've ever made uh, for, for my productivity is I started working on a treadmill desk about five years ago. And I work about half my day on it, so I walk, I don't run, I tried that. It didn't work so well. So I walk and I and I work at the same time. And it just it makes all the little aches and pains that you know build up in your body when you do desk jobs. It makes them go away, which is amazing. A lot of people lose a lot of weight on treadmill desks. There's a lot of benefits, right? So, anyways, that's my thing. I really like that. But spend some time with ergonomics. I mean, you get you can do all kinds of things in, with your office. To, to make it better for your body so your body is less of a distraction, less of a barrier between you and getting things done. So, you know, play with standing desks, play with different heights of desks, play with sitting on walls, play with the light in the room, you know, whatever you can think of. It's kind of fun to do, especially if you're sort of, you know, need, you need a break from something. Just, you know, mess around with your office, try some different things. It doesn't have to be expensive either. So my final tip is that sometimes we get to this point where we're, overly stressed. We're so stressed out that uh, that we just can't really do the next thing. We, we just don't know how to, what that is. Um, we mean, we're depressed. Our bodies feel bad. You know, it's just this, this point where you get completely blocked and, and you can't get any work done. So when we get to that point and some, you know, eventually something will happen that sort of unravels that and we'll be fine. But 
uh, if we can act on it fast, then you can kind of get by it fast. So, so my strategy, I have this algorithm in place. I think it's good to have an algorithm, whatever it is for you. Uh, it might be different than this. But I start sleeping better, so I, I sleep, try to get eight hours of sleep and go to bed at 10.30, which apparently lines us up with our, circuit, our natural circadian rhythms. I start eating good meals every day. I don't eat any junk food. I start exercising half an hour a day, doing cardiovascular weights. And finally, I'll do a sanity check, which for me involves pulling up a processor, uh, word processor program and asking myself questions. And it might sound weird. I don't normally talk to myself. But really, we have like, you know, psychology tells us we have like these different parts of our heads that can kind of talk to ourselves, which is really valuable when it comes to working out problems. So I'll ask myself questions like, why do you feel so weird? Or what do you feel like you really have to get done today? Or maybe even deep stuff like, you know, what is my ultimate goal in my life? You know, just to try to unravel what it is that's blocking you. And doing all of this together helps me get back to the point where I can actually get stuff done, you know, within a day or two. So, uh, like I said, your deal might be, you know, what you do might be a little different, but this is just one idea. All right, so so I promised I would talk about Drupal. <laughs> this is DrupalCon, right? So the reason why it took so long to get to this point is because Drupal sets very well on a couple of the things that I talked about before. So I, the, I wanted to make sure to talk about those first. So I wanted to... to go through the benefits. Why Drupal for freelancing? So for many of you, this is a foregone conclusion. You're already using Drupal for freelancing, but maybe this will help break down the specific things that it, you're finding value of from. And if you can put words to it, that can help you kind of derive more benefits from it just by knowing, knowing what to call it. So anyways, first of all, it's a great portable platform for the more bit. So what I mean by this is that how many freelancers in here have thought, what happens if I die tomorrow? What's going to happen to my clients? Okay, how many of you guys have thought that? Like, uh, okay, so maybe not everybody's as smart as I am, but I've talked with several freelancers, and, and they, they've just independently brought this up. They're like, I want to make sure my clients will be okay if I die tomorrow. You know, it's not like if I decide to not work for them anymore. It's always death. So, so so Drupal, among any framework or CMS, provides this. It gives us a platform that we can use to give to clients and say, hey, you know, if you need help later and I'm not available for whatever reason, um, then uh, you can find someone that knows Drupal. So this is really valuable. But again, this isn't just Drupal specific. Uh, the second thing is that even though Drupal has a learning curve and it takes a while to get to the point where you're actually saving time, you will cross, th cross that threshold at some point. And at that point, your time becomes much more valuable because you're getting more done in a shorter period of time. You have more time to work with. So th again, that's another thing that's common to most frameworks and CMSs. But here's where things get different with Drupal. So in a lot of CMS, uh, in the major CMSs out there, there's marketplaces for modules and themes. There's just established places you go to extend, the, to buy something to extend the functionality of, of those platforms. But in Drupal, sharing is really encouraged, sharing for free. And more than encouraged, it's almost demanded. It's not a choice. So for example, when I started working with Drupal, there were a couple of features of my old CMS that I really wanted in Drupal. So I built some modules to wrap around that functionality. And you know, from everything I could tell, that my only option was to put it on Drupal.org. So I did it. And a couple things happened as a result. First, uh, people started telling me how horrible my code was. So I had some, some comments about you know, not meeting coding standards and security flaws and stuff like that. So, so in one sense, that's criticism. But in another, if you look at it another way, that's mentorship. That's free mentorship. People telling you where the gaps are in your knowledge so that you can get better at doing what you want to do. So that's beautiful, right? And those people that made those comments are people I still know that still, uh, that still, uh, that I still have relationships with. So the other thing that happened is that people started using the modules, and and I started getting comments like, "Hey, thank you so much for sharing this. I really appreciate it. This is valuable." And very few things feel as good as building something and working really hard and being passionate about it and putting it out there for free, and then having people use it and find value in it. Like that process is just. It's like it is the epitome of helping somebody, 
right? So, so that's a wonderful feeling. That sharing process feels really good. You remember the puppies and the baby? Yeah? You guys remember the puppies and the baby? This is a pause just to, you know, see if you guys were listening. Puppies and baby! Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> a little wrinkle. Uh, so, yeah, that whole thing is Drupal. Drupal is puppies and babies just right out of the gate. Okay. Uh, so part of this process of sharing means that you end up connecting with people. You end up connecting with people who are mentoring you, people who are using your stuff, your peers, people that you can help. And so you start to build this network. And, you know, one of the biggest problems of freelancing is not having a network. It's not having people, not having a community. Well, in this process of sharing, you start to build this community. And then you get exposed to tools like IRC, where which is an online chat where there's, at any given time, there's hundreds of Drupalers on there having conversations, answering questions. You can hop on there at any time and ask, ask questions, answer questions, just participate in discussion. And that feeling of just like simultaneously working with hundreds of people across the world just means a lot when you get that sort of solitude feeling when you're working by yourself. Okay, so uh, that networking part of the process ends up beating the solitude beats it down to a pulp, and uh, then, that was supposed to be funny, I didn't want to make it, I'm not an aggressive person, that wasn't real, um, <laughs> it's all acting. Uh, so, there's also something that's unique in the Drupal space, which is the, the, the network of events that happen. So, when I, I went to the CMS Expo, which is a place where a bunch of different content management systems had representatives, I talked with a lot of people there, and they all said that Drupal had this amazing community this amazing infrastructure of events. So we have Drupal user groups where virtually anybody can connect with people in their local area and uh, develop relationships with people that you can see on a regular basis. And then there's Drupal camps where you get to maybe meet some of your Drupal heroes, people who you have a lot of respect for that you know you get some face-to-face -face time with. And then there's Drupal cons like this where you get to see this cross-section of the community from across the globe really feel like you're part of something special and really interesting. So all of this, all of this space time, all of this, uh, you know, physical participation with other people means that your online interactions become a lot more fun and a lot more real. And so all of that helps to make you feel like you're part of something. And that's a, that's a big deal for increasing your stamina to freelance even longer. Everybody following with that train of logic, even if you're not like on board with it? Oh, yeah, so this is a really long list. I'm so sorry. Uh, but this is the last bit. Um, the skills that you build working with Drupal in your freelancing work are all skills that you can build when you work on a startup. So this means that everything that you learn there is can, can help you hit the ground running with your startup. And I want to talk more about that. But first, I want to talk about Lean. Uh, how many people in here aren't quite sure what Lean means? Like Lean startup? Yeah. Okay, so just a couple. I'll summarize it. Um, it. There's a lot of information out there about Lean. It's kind of a buzzword, really popular, um, and there's lots of nuances of it, but the basic idea is very simple, which is that the cheaper and faster you can build a product, the more opportunities you have to fail, which is a good thing because that increases your chance of success eventually, right? So, you know, the cheaper side of things comes from two parts because our expenses... Uh, you know, there's two parts to our expenses. One is human resources, the people that we pay to do the work. Um, and then there's the, the the raw materials, the stuff that we need to actually build the things that we're making. So uh, software is an awesome example of cheap because, one, you can build the skills to produce the software yourself so you don't actually have to hire anybody. You could, but that tends to make it more expensive, right? And also there's very few raw materials that usually come into play with uh, software. You can even put it out there for free, right? So, so software is really cheap. It fits that fits the bill that way. The faster also is, has two facets, uh, two facets to it. The first is that the more skills you can and insight into a market that you can bring to the table when you begin creating a startup, the faster you can produce it because you don't have to ramp up, you don't have to you know do the research, you don't have to build up the skills. The other part of faster, which I alluded to earlier, is the idea that you want to put something out there as quickly as you can before it's perfect. Because you have some ideas of what the market wants. You think that you know. 
but none of us know. We just have some ideas. So it's better to not spend a bunch of time trying to build something perfect because when we put it out there, people are going to tell us that there's too much. We, we don't need all of this stuff. We just needed this particular thing. So if we can put it out there fast, get feedback, and we can iterate through the process of cre creating our product until it becomes something that fits the market like a glove. So when we give a bunch of feedback, that's good. So the epitome, one of the epitomes of a not lean startup might be a restaurant. Uh, I've known a couple of people who have tried this. The problem with a restaurant is that it's expensive. You guys are all falling asleep. That's totally okay. I love you. Um, <laughs> go to sleep. Just close your eyes. Um, so, so anyways, uh, so, so I've known a couple of people who have started restaurants. It costs like $100,000 or $200,000, maybe more, to start a restaurant, which means that most people, you know, that's their life savings or that's at least the savings that they're going to use to try something. So they get one shot at it, and there's so much you can't anticipate. There's so much out of your control. You don't know if another restaurant's going to pop up that's uh, going to be cheaper and better. You don't know if, you know, you, you just don't know. Uh, like, for example, I lived in this really small town. A friend of ours put up a restaurant called So Healthy, which was really awesome for her to do. But this was a really small town where, like, you know, it was all diners and stuff. So it did not, it did not fly. So anyways, so one shot, you can, you can do it wrong. And, and that's it. Whereas software, you can keep going and keep going until you get something that works. All right, everybody got lean? All right, we're all lean now. Okay, so what, what good is Drupal to startups? So the first of all, first of all, like I mentioned before, all the skills that you build while freelancing, you can use while you build your startup. And there's a lot of options that you have in terms of what kind of products you build. So you can touch on virtually any industry with software. And you can build software as a service, you can build information portals, you can build educational tools like I did. Um, you have a lot of options to choose from. And even if you decide that Drupal isn't the software that you're going to use for your eventual product, uh, because some people don't, some people will use something else because they have a different talent pool available to them or something. Um, you can still use Drupal to rapidly prototype because you're really familiar, once you get really familiar with it, you can just quickly try things, and even people who aren't programmers can rapidly build interfaces and model data, things that are really challenging to do, they can do from the front end, which is super powerful, and you can get a lot of mileage out of that. You can build your own website, which is, you know, might sound a little trivial, but if, you, if you've been freelancing and you've done websites for a lot of people, you know the trappings, you know where you can spend a lot of time and it doesn't make sense to spend that time. So you get to fast forward through that whole learning process and build your site really fast and really well. And finally, the network in Drupal is unique because we have developers, but we also have a lot of people who just use Drupal. And those people who just use Drupal represent all kinds of markets. So that when you're at DrupalCon, if you just stand around and you just um, introduce yourself to random people, you're going to make connections in all kinds of different markets just naturally. And you'll have something to talk about because we all do Drupal to some degree, or we don't do Drupal and we can talk about that. And so there's a connection that we have with everybody here. And that means you don't have to be a pushy networker. You don't have to be like, you know, like, hey, this is what I do. It, that will just naturally, you'll naturally talk about what you do because you want to find out if you can help each other. And so this community is really unique that way because we have both sides of the equation. And you'll meet people who will help, help guide you towards particular product ideas. And that can be really, really nice. Okay. So, so that's my talk. I just want to leave you with one final thought, which is that really any of us is, are capable of making transitions. Most of you have made them already, but some of you might be scared uh, or in the middle of a transition that's challenging. So, so my, my, the takeaway I hope you have is that there are things you can do to cultivate joy and happiness in your life. However hokey that sounds, there's a science behind it. And the more you can do that, the more you'll be able to, to weather those difficult transitions. So um, feel free to evaluate this session. If you liked it or didn't like it, you have something to say. Uh, also, we have just a few minutes for questions. Feel free to bail, too. That's totally fine. Um, there's, a, there's a microphone in the middle there where you can ask questions. Um, also, if you don't get the opportunity to ask a question, please send me an email at learn at module.com. I want to hear from you. I want to know what you thought about this. Um, if, and if you have any anecdotes to add or things that I missed, anything. So, so I just want to say thank you.
question. So one of the key principles of Lean Startup is hypothesis, is validating that and, of course, failing. So when you were doing build a module, what kind of failures did you have where you predicted the hypothesis wrong and it had you maybe pivot a little bit to get where you're at right now? Right. Uh, that's a good question. So there's been a lot, right? But the one that pops up into my head is that uh, I had a friend that had a lot of success with long form, uh, long form sales pages, where it's just like text, 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 and you pull someone into a story about how amazing whatever it is you have is for them. And um, so I tried that. I switched out the home page instead of being like links to videos. It was just this long sales letter with like you know a sales pitch at the end. And when I looked at the analytics after doing that, my my uh, my visitor retention just dropped dramatically. And so, you know, that was just, you know, you, you can try a lot of things rapidly with your site. That was just one thing that I tried. But I've tried lots of different ways to organize stuff on the site. Um, I've tried different ways to market things. Like one time I built this backpack that uh, was like my booth on my Mac. It had an iPad on it and an antenna with a flag. And I walked around Drupal events like, you know, with, with this build module flag and stuff, just thinking, well, I don't know, like maybe maybe this will help people learn about it or ask me questions or something. I don't know if that really paid off. So so those are a couple of things. Did that answer your question? Yeah, thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. Hi. Uh, what do you think of uh, angel investors? Oh, yeah, so investment. So that's something I've stayed away from because it scares me a lot. <laughs> So, so I, build, I do build a module by myself. I don't have any partners. I don't anticipate having any partners with it. I don't, I don't have any employees either. So I kind of run solo because I feel like I get the most satisfaction myself in working that way and being able to rapidly change without having to consult anybody about it. That's, that's good to me. I like that. But other people know how to work with other people. <laughs> And so those people can be really successful forming partnerships. And uh, an investor is just a partnership. It's someone who's saying, here, I'm going to give you money and maybe expertise and ideas. And in return, you know, you'll help, you'll help this, you know, you're going to make this succeed or do your best to, to do it. And so for me, like I've always stayed away from it because I don't want to be stuck in a relationship that's going to make me miserable for a long time. But I know people who have had a lot of success like Pantheon. Pantheon has a lot of investors, right? And they've been, as far as I know, they've been really happy about that relationship. Um, and so there's success stories out there. And so it's kind of, I think, a personal, you have to kind of know yourself, right? If, you, if, you, if that sounds good to you, if that sounds exciting, then do it. But if you're doing it just for the money, like, you may find yourself in, in a hard place like that. That's my thought on your place. Thank you. Yeah. startup is, is essentially a product. You, know, you distribute these knowledge items, things like that. That's your product. It would seem to be a little bit more uh, easier to apply the principles of lean startup to a, a broader company. Could you perhaps talk a little bit about how, if you're serving purely services and you're, you sell billable hours, how to apply those same principles of lean startup to that services scenario? Yeah, so so I'm, uh, you know, as, as you know, just hearing this, my experiences are really limited, right? So all I have to talk about are my thoughts and also other people I know who have done done these things. So the people I know who have been the most successful running like web firms, for example, they figure out what the system is uh, to basically make their services a product. You know, it's not like it's sold the same way. You're still selling it as services, but you build it as something that sustains itself, that you don't need to be in there Managing it, you know, you have even a general manager that takes care of of even the management side of it. So some people I know have uh, development firms that completely run by themselves. So I think that's the goal. At that point, it's sort of, I mean, in in a way, it's sort of a productized service because you know you're able to expand it uh, without the input of time yourself. So which I think is the ultimate goal. Just for follow up, but it's, it seems like it's harder to apply the principles of failing fast, right? How you can put something out there, nobody buys it for a week, you deal with it, but when a project may, a service may take six months, 12 months to deliver. So you have to get nice to work and things like that, right? Yeah. So most people I know, uh, they start doing it themselves. They start by doing it themselves. They figure out certain processes that work with one person, and they bring another employee on, which is a big deal. 
right? That's that first employee is a big deal. And then the processes have to change and you try to offset, you know, offload as much as possible to the employee. And then you continue to expand and evolve the process as you go. And at some point, you have the right number of people to take over every role that's needed for that to work. So it's a process. If you decide you're just going to start doing that, I think uh, that would be really hard. I can't imagine a lot of people being successful with that right away. That's kind of a one-shot deal because you're hiring a bunch of people. Now you have all this payroll, right? It's really expensive. So that's the iterative process. You know, it's, it sounds the same to me as the lean thing. You, you start small, you put something out there, and you evolve it until you have a bigger team that's giving exactly what's needed at the time. Hi, um, earlier you were saying you know, you moved from the employee ship to uh, put a website out there and uh, people or companies or clients started going to it. Can you describe that, the transition or, you know, what what drew, drew them to it and how you made that transition? Uh, to freelancing, like to doing freelancing work or? Yeah, kind of in, in between, you know, the part where you put the website out and clients started coming to it and, and that, I guess it's a, yeah, so there, whatever you think. Okay, so, so there are two points where I put a website out and things changed, right? One was when I went into freelancing and then the other was when I put the prototype of build a module out. So, um, so with, with the freelancing side, are you more interested in, just real quick, in the transition into freelancing or the transition into the startup? Okay, okay. So, so my website actually played a big role at the time because I, you know, I learned everything I could about SEO and really targeted the local market so I could, you know, like come up for web development in Idaho, uh, Boise, in Idaho. There wasn't a huge competition at the time. It's a lot, I think it's a lot harder everywhere now to like make a dent in that to begin with. So I ended up getting some leads through that, but most of my initial leads were from direct connections. So I just go to different networking meetings, anything where there was going to be people, uh, like I went to and met people. But the website eventually played a big role in sort of uh, generating those leads. But it was a lot about SEO, about, um, you know, showing up in the search engines. I didn't do a lot of uh, paid, paid, paid search engine stuff. But, um, you know, I put stuff, you know, I tried to build a portfolio, a small portfolio first, did, you know, like a website for my mom and, uh, you know, logos for friends and things like that to have something up. Um, and just randomly people would just, you know, would, would, would call and I'd get some jobs that way. I don't know if that's answering your question at all. That's good. Okay. Um, hi. Awesome presentation. Uh, I just have a, a quick comment kind of toward the last question. Um, with trying to change or to frame your services as a product, I was actually talking to someone in the construction industry and it kind, of, it kind of seems obvious after like I kind of put it all together and basically the idea would be to make things into goalposts and tie like your client interactions and your maybe your billing into that so that you have those opportunities to fail frequently throughout like something like a six month project and then you don't get too far before you you know realize that or you, you know you can do these audits midway through instead of doing you know, all this work and then coming to the end and go, oh, but they had, we had different requirements than, you know, like things like that. It's, it's easier to find out earlier. Right. Yeah. Like, awesome comment. Yep. So, yeah, I see that happen a lot. It, it, it makes sense to, to break it up into sections. That way you learn, one, do you have the skills and the resources to do it? And second, does the client actually, will the client actually pay for it? All right. So one more, one more question. Actually, I just had uh, a comment also. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, with the, uh, the freelancing stuff, so I, I did freelancing for a long time and, like, actually got my first actual employment gig, like, six months ago. It was the first job in, like, 12 years that I had. But it was only because everything matched what I needed, which was really great. But one of the things that actually you mentioned and kind of, I think, jumped over real quickly that looking back, if I did things differently doing freelancing, if I ever do it again, I built it differently, um, was you said when you came back you were doing more like subcontracting mm -hmm. for some other shops. So like personally one of the things for me as a freelancer that was
probably the, the most difficult, not skill-wise, but just mentally and emotionally, was doing the business management stuff, getting work, doing marketing, doing invoicing, tracking people down and getting them to pay you. I mean, it's grueling, and that's the cost of doing business that is not necessarily what we want to be doing. So given the market now and how everybody that you know is trying to hire somebody, you can you could write your own ticket if you wanted to get a job, but I think a really smart thing to do is to actually go out and make contact with a bunch of different firms and say, I'm not looking for a job per se, I'm looking for um, you know, a longer term contract, be it 10 hours a week, 20 hours a week, what have you, and setting up maybe a couple of those and then you get that kind of variability and that challenge in different areas, you get the interaction with different people, but you don't have to have the burden all on yourself of trying to go out and do all the marketing and getting clients and stuff. So that's something that I would do differently and maybe sometime I could. Cool. Thanks, Ron. All right. So thanks again for, every, for you guys for coming. Have an excellent rest of the DrupalCon.